Yeah. <laughs> the resolution states the United States federal government should end the tax exempt status of religious organizations. Let's go over a couple of observations. The first, we're going to move you towards a tax exempt status. That basically means that right now, religious organizations are not required to pay taxes. They're basically exempt from the overall federal law by which normal organizations would be, uh, would be uh, uh, necessarily paying things like property taxes. The second observation, this is a policy round because of the word should, implies a call to action. Therefore, evaluate through net benefits. The third observation is our resolution, which is basically, uh, it is the plan text, which is basically the resolution of the United States federal government will end the tax and status of religious organizations. It's going to happen as soon as possible and also normal means. Let's go over the first advantage about wealth inequality. What's happening right now is that ch churches and religious organizations are hoarding a lot of money right now. You can see that the A argument that there, have been, uh, that there was an investigation in 2009 in which a couple of preachers, specifically uh, the uh, Myers, uh, Myers Ministry, basically ministry, their income was basically over $124 million a year. All of this was spent on vast uh, luxury expenditures such as trips abroad, um, fan uh, fancy meetings, and the B argument is that each individual preacher around the top uh, one percent of them, or sixty to seventy percent of the United States top ministers, earn around twenty-three thousand dollars for each public outing that they take. Yes, this is quite a lot of money. But the second argument is that money is not really allocated to a lot of charities. You can see here that the church actually restricts a lot of money that is would necessarily be allocated towards individuals. You can see that the marginalized individuals are first to be impacted as they are because a lot of this money is sent and claimed to be used for supporting infrastructure planning because the churches use the excuse that they don't use it, that they don't pay up to, uh, proper property taxes for it, it, as an incentive to keep this type of money and try to use it in order to uh, uh, use it for their benefit. But um, you can see that there's a, there, there, according to a study by uh, according to a study done by Sidorsky, you can see that storefront churches are the uh, major contributor to poverty and social dysfunction in poor communities because churches basically remove the valuable commercial property by which they don't have to basically like pay the property tax, which basically means that a lot of the a lot of the communities in which really rich neighborhoods really which uh, uh, churches are, it just that devalues the, the surrounding property because they don't actually pay the property taxes, which means that those into that that area is not actually labeled by the government as something of uh, of wealth. This link argument, I'll take you on this. The link argument is that first of all, the taxes that they are now going to be uh, that they're now not going to be exempt from means that this wealth is more equally dispersed. You can see that uh, there will be around approximately a hundred thousand billion dollars that will be added to the tax base if churches and religious organizations started paying. All of the uh, started paying for this, and you can see you would see that there, there's an immediate decrease in the amount of storefront churches that are uh, that are causing a lot of wealth income inequality because the property values would necessarily be allowed to rise now because now it's going to be docketed in by the government and uh, the data will be collected and but and as a as a, as a result these uh, these communities would actually see a rise in the amount of quality of life over there. But the B argument is that around 10% of the annual income traditionally, if it was to come from these institutions would be allocated towards specific social welfare programs, a majority of which are uh, a majority of which are for individuals of marginalized uh, of marginalized status. The second argument is that the church would necessarily see a decrease in the amount of corruption. That means that these preachers don't have the ability to concentrate all of this wealth anymore because they cannot use the excuse that they are just using it for infrastructure planning when obviously they are paying a property tax that would necessarily take care of all of that. So the impacts that first of all, yes. Also, the IRS would basically audit them, which would prevent investment. We would argue that the amount of corruption that is happening now is on a scale that is not even being tracked by the government, which is probably bad because you see a lot of money that's just being shoved under the rug. But the impacts that, first of all, wealth concentration is really, uh, we're preventing wealth concentration. The A argument is this contributes to a lot of poverty in these marginalized uh, uh, areas. And when you're in poverty, you can take up to seven years of your life, and this is cyclical, and the churches have, uh, some of these churches have been in there for thousands, uh, for hundreds of years. So the B argument is that the key for in, uh, income is the internal link to any type of agency that these individuals can see. Because right now they cannot even say, they cannot even, uh, they, they don't even have data or uh, examples as to how their church has been uh, extremely manipulative in these areas. We probably need the way of your internal links to making sure that these people have a better quality of life. Question. So what do you mean by a storefront church? Oh, a storefront church, this is just like a colloquial term that says that store, uh, churches that are in particular communities um, that are major contributors to poverty societal and So they're just in yeah, they're in communities, but in which they they don't pay any property taxes, and that like decreases the value of surrounding properties. The second advantage is specifically about legality. The 
what's happening in the status quo is that um, there's an unreciprocal spending allocation between the church and the state. You can see there, uh, that there are a couple of Supreme Court cases that prove why this is true. That historically, the government has actually been putting a lot of money into churches, but the church does not, is not reciprocal in this type of transaction, and this is necessarily unconstitutional. For example, on March 4, 2019, the Supreme Court said that uh, in a case of Morris, Morris County versus Freedom for Religion Foundation, it established that churches receiving taxpayer funds was necessarily unfair because churches don't pay taxes themselves. But the deed argument is that the Morris County received approximately $4.6 million in taxpayer funds, and they were reallocated from state infrastructure projects, specifically for these churches that were already, uh, that were not suffering any type of infrastructure uh, de degradation, which means that the state is necessarily allocating more, uh, more money than necessary to these churches and not getting any reciprocal response. But the C argument is that the Lutheran Church versus Corner, uh, versus Corner in 2017, that specific case, the church was rejected on the ground that, that no money can be taken from the straight treasury with the, if this relationship is not reciprocal. It seems it's not constitutional what we are doing in the status quo. What happens when we pass our plan is that, first of all, this ends the tax exempt status, which means that on average when they're paying these taxes, it instills $100 billion in the United States tax rolls that it now can be allocated specifically back to these churches if they want that type of money, and then it's becoming a more fair process. But the second link is that reciprocity is specifically key. The A argument is that SCOTUS cases legitimize the right of the nation to tax institutions that are asking for infrastructure building in the first place because they're getting money right now from individuals that are not related to the church whatsoever or don't necessarily support religious institutions, and that is unconstitutional within itself. But the B argument is that it funds the smaller churches. There's actually been smaller case studies. In Pennsylvania, there were certain cities that were collecting some mandatory donations from big churches to actually fund, uh, to refund, to reallocate this money to smaller churches that would necessarily be closed down if they didn't have enough money right now. Which probably means if we have a bigger tax base, we can actually reallocate money towards uh, smaller churches that don't have the support in the status quo. The impact is that we are establishing a rule of law, that the Constitution means that churches are, uh, that are for profit are also abiding by the same type of laws that uh, corporate institutions are. But also, B, this is good for things like diplomacy because it encourages equity between civilians, which is key to quality of life. They're not profit organizations, so they're literally having to like give away the money that they use. 
boost it in order to just kind of keep the like, lights on. So basically, so we're seeing that people are giving less charity because they're um, going to be like involved less in the way because there's these less churches existing. But secondly, we see that the churches themselves are going to have less of the ability to donate. According to a study by the Housing and Urban Development um, Administration, we see that churches spend between 15 and 20 billion dollars annually, um, and this is through privately raised funds from their congress on social services. So if we, overall, we're seeing that this leads to internally seems to how churches and uh, how charity is going to be is going to decline without this traffic effect. So the impact or without this charity, we're seeing that there is less income like, distributed to the people who are most need it, whether this is for social services or just donating to food banks, which is one of the, one of the main places that churches donate to. And so overall, this is going to be like decreasing the amount of like um, income that the like poor people are, are that the most impoverished people are able to gain through charity from churches. So the second disadvantage is that of community. It's your point you need First, we see that financial strain on churches has increased by 20% in the last decade, um, with 5% unable to recover from financial setbacks, according to the Hartford Institute for Religious Research. Second, we see that churches and religious organizations are able to decrease crime and drug use, according to the Family Research Council, with 83% having programs to help the need. Third, we see that religious organizations provide mental and physical health, um, health care, food, shelter, clothes, therapy, and much more to their communities. Specifically, in Philadelphia, they provide $247 million per year of services. So the Visa Point in the list, first we see with the tax on religious organizations who are already facing a financial strain, that, um, they, they would not be able to, uh, to sustain it more, and they would be closing down, and they'll be able, they won't be able to provide as many essential resources services to communities. Did you have a question? So C7.8 internal and sees that these crucial services help many people that can't get resources elsewhere, but there's organizations to help people um, buy stuff. So besides this like charity component, we're also seeing that like there's a community base within the churches to like just help people find jobs just through like having a central place for people to be able to connect with each other. And they also provide shelter, and people are more likely to be able to sustain a job with the help of these churches. So the impact here is a decrease in quality of life, uh, basically through this increase in sickness and malnutrition because the churches are able to give these same sorts of um, like sort of same sorts of charity. And secondly, it's going to be increasing unemployment because people like go to churches in order to find jobs. They also like lots of churches have they'll have formal business work for people to be able to borrow in the case of interviews. And so there's these key parts here that the church provides. So on the app case, so first they talk about the tax first off the top they talk about the tax exemption is not paying taxes. So I first want to reiterate how the reason a church is a, has a tax exemption is because it's a non-profit. It's not because they somehow skirted around the system. It's because they're not actually like gaining any sort of profit to stakeholders or bondholders. So now specifically looking onto the advantage here. They say that um, preachers right now are hoarding a lot of money that like uh, they take trips abroad. But what we're seeing is that the status quo is already solving for this. According to the Washington Examiner, having online donations has been able to allow for people to actually track what their donations are being used for. There's new apps and different times types of online technology in order to donate money, and that's specifically been allowing for a decrease in the amount of money that preachers and uh, different members of the like church authority have been able to hoard. So secondly, they say that there's money not being allocated to charity, and the marginalized people are hurt first. You can cross-apply the statistics that my partner that I give um, in our DA about specifically how like 83 percent of these churches have programs to help the need, and they've been giving millions of dollars within their communities in order to help people. And they say these storefront churches in that community is like hurt them and they devalue the surrounding property. But we're going to argue that if you have these property values increase, that's going to make it more expensive for people to actually be able to purchase a home and be able to like rent a house in these areas because either the landlords are going to be having to charge a higher rent in order to maintain the value of their, uh, like to maintain having their house, or people are just going to like literally have to pay a higher mortgage. So it's probably going to need a unique reason why having these churches here is a good fit. So basically, then they say that the wealth is going to be more equally distributed, and because and because there's just going to be like lots of money distributed, but they don't actually show you what the way for this money to be distributed for. For is the money is just going to go into the government, and it's probably going to like go into the biggest spending ticket there is, which is the military anyway. They don't let them get off on the idea that just this money will somehow be redistributed to the rest of the population without clear marks. So then they say that there's going to be like this decrease in corruption, but they also aren't saying like uniquely why this corruption is bad. We're saying that these people, like the money that people in the church are able to get is because of donations from the individuals. So the member, the congregants of the church are choosing to give their money to the church to be able to fund the preachers and fund the people who are in charge of the churches because they see that as a key investment in their world. So then they say that like there's 
uh, income on their entire level. I just want to address the fact that they say that like income equals agency, but we're not saying that the churches are like taking away incomes from specific from people and having this tax exempt status when isn't going to have like the government giving like some sort of income to people. All right. On the advantage too about legality, we give all these arguments specifically about how the church, um, like how the how it's unconstitutional for the government to be giving money to the churches that are not receiving a tax exempt status, and they believe that like removing this tax exempt status is going to be like the key way to solve this. But the important part here to note is that what these uh, court cases showed is that it's the fact that the funding to the churches themselves that's the unconstitutional part. It's the fact that the government is giving money to religious organizations and it taking part in uh, taking part in this like establishment of religion. So if we just have the federal government no longer actually giving money to the um, to the church, to the religious organizations, that's going to remove the issues with the gap here. Okay. Um, the order is going to be the after order and the next order. Is that wrong? Sure, but the money goes elsewhere. Because the people making the donations don't even know what's happening with money. 
Finally, we make the argument that we aren't able to give people income, but you can just cross my response that this did not happen in Pennsylvania, and there's an already an allocated amount of money set out for these individuals, which means we get access to our impact about what constitutes to poverty. Let's go to the second advantage of legality. The only response here is that the funding is the unconstitutional part, not the tax exempt status. A couple responses here. First reason is that the only reason the funding is unconstitutional is because the church does not pay taxes. The funding would be okay if the church gave something back to the United States federal government, which means the only way to make things constitutional is by taxing the church. The second argument here is that the status quo does not solve. They provided no analysis why in the status quo the United States federal government would just get rid of their funding to churches, which means it's a try or die for the affirmative to actually level the playing field and make sure we solve them this time. This means you can accept all the arguments on this event because they go completely conceited about how we're actually able to ensure that these churches give back to the state and ensure that reciprocity happens, which means we can access our impacts about rule of law. Okay, let's go on to the next I'll take all questions at the end. So on your first disadvantage about charities, on the Unique Consult, they talk about how US people donate more to charities because of philanthropy. A couple responses here. The first response is that their uniqueness overwhelms the link. If people are so generous in the United States, they're still going to donate to charities, even in a world in which churches are just taxed. Like they can just donate to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to solve malaria. That's, there's an absolutely no articulation for why churches are key. But the second response here is that you can actually look towards the fact that atheism is on the rise in the United States and it has doubled within the last generation, which is an indication that having churches is not so relevant in the debate about charities. But the third response here is that people will still donate to churches just because churches are taxed does not mean that churches cannot still give money to charities, right? They provided no great analysis that shows that churches will collapse when they, we levy a tax against them. You can look towards the fact that individuals, like people, like we are taxed, but individuals also still choose to donate to charity, which means that there's also like no link to the disadvantage. Next, they make this argument about how churches will shut down on the link level. A couple responses here. The first response is that uh, this did not happen in places like Pennsylvania where we implemented small scale versions of the plan, which means it's probably empirically denied. But the second response here is that we are actually able to help these small churches, specifically also because when we have the IRS go in, they're actually able to give things like tax refunds to churches that are struggling, which indicates that we are actually better able to target the churches that need the most help. Your second link is about how there's a decrease in charity. The first response here is that there's simply no link here, right? Because churches will still, if churches want to donate, they will still donate when they are taxed. Because taxing is not a reason to stop donations because like everyone else is taxed. But the second response here is that you can look towards things like housing allowances. They're currently um, treated differently from income with both individuals, secular individuals, and with religious organizations. So these services and programs can still exist even in a world in which churches are taxed. On the internal link level, they make all these arguments about how people feel less connected, but our argument is that people can still form their own congregations without the structure of a church. You don't need a pastor to still worship a religion. But secondarily, we make the argument that once again, churches are not going to collapse based on the reasons we are given. Next, their second internal link is about churches not donating. Our first argument here is that this is also just outweighed by the sheer amount of embezzlement that is happening within the status quo, which even in a world in which churches collapse, we're still saving money and providing more money for the government to actually better target social service programs. And secondarily, having the IRS involved forces the church to make more efficient donations so they're actually wasting less money and better able to target it. So they don't get access to their impacts about income. On their second disadvantage, they talk about how there's currently financial strain of churches within the last decade. This probably means that if in the status quo, churches can still provide services while they're experiencing financial strain, that means there's a very low probability that they will stop providing these services when their time passes. But the second response here is that uh, we would make the articulation that they will be more, have more resources to actually provide these social services when the pastors are not taking all the money for themselves. Remember, there's like a $5 billion difference in the amount of money that, that is embezzled versus the amount of money spent on charity, which means necessarily we would increase the amount of programs that help for these services. On the link level, they make the argument that churches close down. You can just cross the my response. Their entire case is predicated on this one link that I've already answered multiple times. And their second argument about finding jobs, you would articulate that there are alternative services like job hunting services or um, a government subsidized housing that are also able to solve. Yeah. All right. On your advantage two, what specifically is unique for why is it? Um, why did the courts think that the churches needed to be able to give back? I mean, the argument is that in order for the government to fund the churches, the churches have to pay taxes. Yeah. Okay, so the order is uh, negative order after.
Everyone ready? Yeah. Starting time now. Uh, first of all, on the disadvantage, they say that the unique and overwhelming is the link. What we're seeing is that, and they see that people will still be donating this link in an action. It's not an action church link. We see that people know to donate because of churches and like extend our uniqueness. Um, point number one about how Americans donate seven times more the in most religious nation in the world and showing that there's a direct correlation between um, our high religious involvement and how much we are um, donating to these uh, things. And also they say that like atheism is increasing, but like we're still showing that it's still we are the number one um, donator in the like in the in the world. And also what we're going to be seeing is that like the real people who are religious are donating more. So like it's really like the correlation between the increase in atheism has nothing to do with the amount of donations that are occurring because people in the status quo are still donating a lot to these charities if they are religiously affiliated. They say that there's um, one second, yeah, yeah. So they said that there's um there's like there's no rank to world world collapse because like we talk about how they're giving um, they, they're giving 10% more likely to give uh, to if religious, but like cross apply that there is a brink right now in the status like in the status quo, and they're going to trigger the trigger the impact because cross apply on my disadvantage too in 2010 about how there was a financial strain um, of and by 20 increase by 20% and 5% of uh, churches were unable to recover, and if every single church was to be taxed, like no longer be taxed with them, the strain would increase even larger. Um, also, like they talk about how the government can like provide all these things, we see that the government has more overhead costs, and this isn't going to be as much of a priority. Um, they say that people are being outweighed by investment. We're seeing is that like look to the weight mechanism of net benefits. They don't really provide any reason how people are directly being harmed by this investment. They just say like this money could be going towards our welfare, but they don't provide how they can dare. There's not high probability that more money could be going towards these people in a world where the government provides it versus when some money is going to embezzlement, meaning that you're going to have to prefer mitigation and status quo because we provide, um, like that we can say, show that we can provide for more people under the status quo. Um, they say that, like, we talk about, like, how people will donate less, um, churches can't survive, and they said, like, this isn't going to happen, but, like, like look to, like, these poorer areas about how, um, when, like, how they, they're not going to close down, they say, like, they're not going to be able to join us. We say, look to these poor areas, um, not just like the really rich areas, the ones that the churches are on the verge of collapse. They're not going to be able to donate, and they're already not being able to donate because they have such a large um, financial strain. Also, they talk like tax refunds um, go to churches and stuff, but this is, this is just going to be the basic necessity for these churches to sustain themselves. And it's not like the government's going to be like, we're going to give you enough money to maintain um, your, your church, but also give you enough money to survive. Um, supply to welfare to individuals in your community. See, like our government is highly dominated by Republicans right now, and they're very like civilian to give money for welfare right now. They're not going to like increase the amount of welfare spending that easily. Um, also, so like just there's just going to be enough to donate the tax refunds that, in, that the churches guarantee are going to be getting. Um, they said that programs can still exist. We're seeing that like non-religious organizations are like low, like the non-religious organizations that are providing welfare to, in, to communities right now is low, the, and the government is not doing a good job of sustaining. We mean that churches is like a very key source to providing for charities and communities. Okay, moving on to. The Okay, this is this is people are forming congregations without structure. We see that like former religion in the United States is based on like congregations with like ministers and structure. Okay, moving on to disadvantage too about community. They see they have more resources if not taking money and like investing money. We're seeing that like you can't guarantee this check back of investment. We see that like extend my partner about how individuals are direct can directly give money to churches and they don't actually have to guarantee but they don't actually have to write this in their taxes, so there's not actually a guaranteed check back. People can still embezzle this money. Check back also the status quo Oh, also like also like check out being exists in the status quo and it's not in it's not if it like it's as bad as they think it's not gonna really change that much if you're gonna put this plan. You see that if you were to um if you were to embezzle money, you could lose your 504, but people it's like it's 503 C status. Okay, um they see that the link fails about how um about church closing. We see that we see that this is happening right now in status quo, that church, like religious organizations are on the verge of class, and this is like a root of a lot of people's belief systems and a lot of people's like way of survival because a lot of people depend especially in these communities on these church meaning that we see it happening in the status quo and it trigger this link, making it so that there's a very high probability of, of it occurring. Um, and okay, so they talk about, I would talk about how the churches help um, people find jobs. So they see that there's other governmental services that is, that help people do this. We see that like it's the government does on like this big level is not as good as focusing in on this community and using like these community connections with members of like 
congregations that are really crucial to helping people find jobs, and the government is also not very successful at like finding jobs that are able to sustain people. Also, um, extend what my partner says about how this having shelter is crucial to keeping and maintaining a job. So even if like, the government was able to find you a job, there is not enough shelter for like every single individual. Like most of the communities around us in our own town, we see that the the, pop the homeless population has been growing like exponentially, and the government is not reacting properly. Meaning that um, like the, this is why churches are uniquely key to provide shelter so people can sustain a job and it helps people get jobs through like their connections um, of the church as a whole and also like just the individuals that are part of the foundation. So what we're going to be seeing is that you're going to extend our impact about um, how they're going to be decreasing the quality of life. And they're going to make it so people can't like people like rely on going to their churches for like daily meals and they're going to increase the over amount amount of bound nutrition when people are not properly fed it makes it so that they're harder it's harder for them to like sustain working and it makes it so they're more susceptible to like sickness and also you extend how they're going to be increasing unemployment um because people are going less likely to go to get jobs and they're also going to be less likely the people have been relying on these churches once they close um to be able to sustain these jobs okay moving on to the affirmative case um so they said that like they say that um, in response to the, how these are 503 seeds, so they're nonprofits, they see that for profit goes to the head to keep for them themselves right now. What we're seeing is that this is like in this is potentially inevitable and they can't really guarantee that this check back on this. We said like earlier about how it's not happening in the steps, but they can't really they don't provide a link on how this they can guarantee check back. Um, now, just they say that like then it has to be reported in taxes and mean the government will check back, but like people commit tax fraud all the time. Like people, like nonprofit organizations that have a lot of money, like um, and people who invest money in these companies and they get away with it without being caught because they just like um, like declare bankruptcy with or like file their taxes wrong. Okay, so um, on their advantage one about the wealthy and wealth inequality distribution, we, we, we always see that we should be implementing plan because in the status quo, more people are benefiting from. Um, these welfare programs, then people are benefit, then people are being harmed from like this potential embezzlement, and well, um, and like the people who are getting these welfare systems have done nothing wrong, so we should not pen penalize them because of, of like the rarity of like actual people leaders of like congregations doing something wrong. Um, they say like people ha are hacking, but like there's very low probability that people are actually going to be hacking in to like a church's congregation thing. Um, also, like the reason they'd be hacking in is probably if they had something probably like, wrong with the religion, not if it was had to do with like the money. So there's a very low probability of this happening. Um, they, they they say that like the status quo is bad. There's no money in programs. Like and they're not they're doing it for the wrong thing, but like they're because they're embezzling. But this is essentially inevitable. They can't solve for this. Um, they say that 10% of the income is going to welfare, but there's not enough to place uh, people right now. And they said that they can't solve. Um, for social security welfare, the status quo is going to be solving better than the affirmative. And also, like they see the case just shows that there's an increase in smaller money to churches, but link that links into advantage two, meaning that like if they provide more money to the smaller churches because they're collapsing, this is essentially making it so that they're promoting, they're like so the government will be supporting religion. Okay, now moving on to disadvantage two about legitimacy. They say funding is unconstitutional because they can't tax. It's not the only way. To <coughs>
focus on first before giving to charity. So there's not going to be some, they're not going to be able to maintain the same levels of donations. And so then on the impact here, you're going to be seeing that there's less money given to charities. Specifically, they drop the war region that 15 to 20 billion dollars are given annually um, in privately raised funds to social services according to the Housing and Urban Development Agency. So they try to they continue to make this argument that there's not actually money going to charity from churches. But it's really clear from the numbers here that billions of dollars go directly from churches to the people who need it most. On the affirmative case. On their advantage point about wealth inequality, they rely on this idea that the money is going to be more equally distributed once there's taxes given. But when we're looking at a minister who they claim is like the, who can kind of decide, who's basically like the for-profit person here, and deciding what, where the money goes, similarly, they're going to be maintaining their high salary and not giving, and not cutting part of their salary in order to give to charities, if the preachers are as corrupt as, as um, they're making to believe. So what we're seeing here at the end of the day, oh, and then secondly, on the property value argument, you're going to be seeing that the key part here is that is that people need to just be able to afford a house in the first place. So even if there's these eventual harms of people no longer being able to like sell the house they already have, that's probably affecting the middle class, or, like middle class more. And uh, so we're so time. Any answer to property values being high is better is new because your partner dropped this entire argument. I can still reiterate the argument that I made in the immediate outlet scene. I won't say the middle class. So, okay. so basically, still we're saying that the people who need to afford houses in the first place and need to be able to like be, uh, rent houses from landlords are still going to be hurt here in the first place. They drop the argument specifically about how rents will rise if the property values are higher because that's the only way that the landlords would be able to maintain their uh, maintain their ability to hold on to that house. And so you're not seeing that there's actually some sort of uh, decrease in the wealth concentration because these preachers are, if they're so corrupt in the first place, they're not going to suddenly be non-corrupt when the taxes go, when the taxes go. Moving on to the advantage too about legality. They, they have conceded the point here where the reason it's not legal is because money is going from the government to the church. It's not because of the lack of money going from the churches to the government. So when we see that they're not actually going to be solving for that, so they're just probably going to be maintaining this illegality of money going from the government to the churches without actually solving for it. They're not actually solving for any issue of illegality. Also, don't let them put like expand upon their impact here. They just kind of do this vague idea about like the rule of law, but don't actually internalize these impacts here. So, last one, on the disadvantage to about community. You're going to be buying a more here that there's already financial strain on churches right now. But what's key here is that when you have to add all these taxes, that's going to exacerbate that financial strain even more. And specifically, when we see that churches are key to being able to connect their congregants with jobs because of these community connections, that's going to be a unique advantage to the um, to the negation. And so you're going to be um, extending across the, the affirmation for increasing unemployment. So overall, what you see here is that churches are a key part of the United States of infrastructure giving to charity. And the, uh, and the negation affirmative is going to be making the churches go away. Thank you. 
were able to, uh, this money was not being embezzled, uh, it wasn't being embezzled at a lesser rate. But third of all, we increased the scrutiny of these churches to actually dock, uh, or actually look at the amount of money that they're spending, which means we have a risk of solvency. But even if you don't buy any of that, even if they size up the IRS, it is still tired out for the affirmative. But in the status quo, they can see that it's the worst type of corruption that has ever existed for embezzlement by these churches, which means that right now, online checks and online donations do not solve that. They do not respond to any of Sharon's arguments about how online uh, online is actually worse, that it increases the risk of hacking, that it's not sufficient. You actually need to be registered for the IRS, not just use it, just transferring the money from a, a GoFundMe into your credit card account, which probably means the status quo is not sufficient to solve for embezzlement and to try or die for the affirmative. So let's go specifically onto our first advantage about on the link level and prove to you why we are still winning in terms of probability. First of all, they can see a couple of key warrants over here. That first of all, there's a low probability of churches that are shutting down, which means that their disadvantage is already thumped by our first by our first advantage with our Pennsylvania case study. That when money was actually uh, taken in by mandatory uh, by uh, with mandatory ta uh, uh, mandatory state taxes, that they were reallocated into smaller. Uh, smaller churches, which means that there is no risk of church collapse. But second of all, that means that we are, we are the internal link to increasing charities, because the entirety of the negations case is predicated off of one link, one link that the smaller churches are going to collapse. But what if we have proven that these churches are actually going to be able, there is a risk of in, uh, of distributing all of the wealth, that means that we are the internal link to increasing the amount of money that charities are now going to be receiving because we keep small churches alive. But if you don't buy that probability analysis, you can extend a very damning warrant that Sharon reads over here. The $37 billion over here are wasted in eclectic uh, embezzlement funds versus the $2 billion that are given to charities. This was a warrant that was conceded by the negations case, which proves that even if these churches are giving a lot of money to charities, it is still a net loss in comparison to the amount that they are keeping in corruption and is lost in these types of co corrupt transaction methods, which means that any, uh, uh, there, which means that our magnitude of impact is always going to be outwearing theirs because a the majority of the money that will not be embezzled, at least if the IRS is now tracking it, which means that there is a higher probability that we are able to decrease embezzlement, which means on the impact level, you can always see how income inequality, we are solving for the root cause of it because the reason that these individuals don't have a lot of money right now is because churches are decreasing their property value. We would argue that having how higher how housing value allows people to sell their houses at higher rates and, and uh, decrease the amount of gentrification that is happening in these areas, which means that we solve for the root cause of the financial strain that is happening in these churches in the first place. Yeah, housing allowances give people houses in the first place, which means that it's just a question of making sure that these churches are also responsible for their financial issues. On to the uh, disadvantages. All of their disadvantages are non unique because there are relationship between there, there's no relationship between charities and churches. All of their case depends on one link, which means that if we prove that small churches are not going to collapse, we vote for the affirmative. But they don't have links because donors will still donate if even if there are taxes, because they will still be in because their second their second disadvantage admitted that even in times of financial struggle, rich people were still donating to the state, which means community involvement is a non unique issue. But second of all, there's no reason why charity from churches is key. Even if churches collapse, the rich can still donate to this this articulation that money that charity from churches is key is not key is in the right of the problem. Sharon, um, I, my first argument on the disadvantage is that people can still donate to Bill and the Gates Foundation, which means like secular organizations can solve church money. Yeah, that was definitely an argument. There's no reason why charity from churches is key, which means the rich can still donate to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation even if churches collapse, which means that there is no risk of a disadvantage even if you buy all of their link arguments. But third of all, they consider that we can solve for their disadvantages because churches are the largest amount of corruption right now and they're causing the collapse of these smaller churches because of the fact that they're hoarding a lot of money, which means that any risk of our welfare being able to be distributed works. They try to say that the welfare will not be distributed, but we have already articulated that 10% of annual income is traditionally allocated to social welfare programs whenever corporations are taxed. That was coming out of my first speech, which means that 10% is always going to outweigh 0% of that money being allocated toward these individuals in the status quo, which means that we can resolve for issues such as charities and there is no link to the community, which means they have a very low probability of their link happening and you vote for the affirmative.